Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. In our next conversation with Dr. Daniel Stone, we're going to talk about William Bickerton's relationship with Sidney Rigdon. Bickerton was a very big admirer of Sidney Rigdon, but it turns out that he lost faith in Rigdon's leadership. We'll learn more about that, as well as Rigdon's brief flirtation with Brigham Young and the LDS Church. Check out our conversation. I also want to remind you, please subscribe to our newsletter. Go to gospeltangents.com slash newsletter so you can learn any inside scoops and that sorts of things. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, there's a ton of stuff that's going on in the newspapers about Sidney Rigdon. That's one of them. There's another interesting thing, because Sidney Rigdon, he was really hurt by being excommunicated by the Twelve, mm-hmm. because Sidney Rigdon did not agree with polygamy. Joseph Smith had earlier asked Nancy, uh, just Sidney Rigdon's daughter, to, you know, to be one of his uh, plural wives, and Nancy you know, rebuffed him and said no. And Sidney eventually hears, from, hears about this and confronts Joseph Smith and kind of you know, real quick, what ends up happening is he basically confronts Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith kind of denies it at first, but eventually Sidney gets him to admit it. And they kind of make this pact where, I'll paraphrase the pact, but basically he, he makes Joseph Smith repent in that instance. And jo, or that's according to, you know, the, the Rigdon account. And mm-hmm. basically the, the deal is, okay, you're not going to do this anymore, and I'm going to keep my mouth shut. And we're just going to, you know, kind of continue because Sidney Rigdon and Joseph Smith, their their relationship was kind of strained, and this is one of the reasons why it was strained. Um, but well, you know, Joseph asked to marry his daughter, which is just mind blowing to mm-hmm. me. Yeah, so Sidney did not like that, <laughs> and it really was a shock to him because he was not privy to polygamy, according to um, John Wycliffe. Right, so according to his account, he says that his father was not privy to polygamy until this this proposal to Nancy. Yeah. So And I remember Nancy <laughs> said something to the effect somebody said, Are you calling the prophet a liar? And she said, Yes, because he does lie. Oh my God. <laughs> it's quite a quote. Yeah. So it really it really is hot news. So what ends up happening is he knows Brigham Young is practicing polygamy. He kind of has this knowledge. Well when he loses that's when he basically decides, I'm not keeping my mouth shut anymore. And I believe it was Orson Hyde. So when, uh, when Sidney Rigdon gets on a steamboat to head back, it was the steamboat Offspree, and when he heads, starts you know, start to head east again to go to Pittsburgh, that's where he's going to escape, and, you know, since he's been excommunicated. I believe Orson Hyde tells him, and it's in the book, he basically says, be careful how you put pen to paper in this time of excitement. Wait a few months and then see how you feel. Because he knew Sidney was really upset. But Sidney was like, no, I am going to put pen to paper because he was a really good writer and good order. And he says, I'm going to expose the 12. And he basically, this was his payback. And that's exactly what he does. He goes back to Pittsburgh, creates another church called the Church of Christ. In his mind, he's kind of trying to restore the restoration because he believes he's the rightful successor since he's the first counselor. And He's just, and he's exposing the 12. He's basically saying, Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. The 12 are now instituting it. They've been practicing this in secret. And the 12, all this time, including when Joseph Smith dies in the 12, they're publicly saying, no, we're not practicing polygamy. And Signy's trying to expose it to the world. Yes, they are. And in, in, in April of 1845, he basically starts the Church of Christ on the, the 15th anniversary of the original church of April 1830. Oh, so wow. there's a lot of symbolism in that. Mm-hmm. And they're doing it in Pittsburgh. And this is where you get to see the newspaper accounts really kind of catching on with uh, Sidney Rigdon. Oh, wow. Because the second to last day of the conference, this major historical event happens in Pittsburgh. It's in the history books now call it the Great Conflagration of 1845. And literally the whole city of Pittsburgh is on fire. <laughs> so <laughs> as the, the Rigdonites are, uh, you know, conducting their, their, uh, their the organization of their church uh, during the conference, they hear shrieks and cries outside the windows. And they look and see and they see the city of Pittsburgh is on fire, which they're in. So according to the, the Church of Christ Rig, Rigdon's minutes, they say that they all get down and kneel and pray. And when they pray, they say that they have visions of angels leaving the building and going out of the windows to go help put out the fire. And eventually they say that the city was spared and you know the whole city didn't burn down to the ground. But the newspapers heard about this and really caught on. I'll, I can read you part of the, one of the newspaper accounts just so you can kind of get an idea of it. It said... Um, 
When the story of Rigdon saving the city reached the secular press, people were repulsed. These fanatics quietly pursued their mummeries while the city was consuming, the Pittsburgh Daily Gazette and advertiser huffed. Our citizens would have thanked them to send their escort of heavenly messengers a little sooner and not have waited until the fairest part of our city was laid in ashes and many lives had fallen a sacrifice to the devouring element. Rigdon's newspaper contained other strange things, the writer claimed, and promoted as many absurdities in this enlightened age as ever took place in the darkest eras. <laughs> so, so you see, it's really hot news. Mm -hmm. So how William Bickerton gets within all this is obviously he's reading the newspaper accounts like this, and he's hearing the stories about the Solomon Spalding manuscript, about the miracles, about the, you know, the fake revelations that people are saying. And obviously he gets curious. You know, He never actually writes exactly why he went to go see Sidney Rigdon, but we know that this was such hot news. It obviously piqued his curiosity like it would anybody. So Sidney Rigdon in 1845 is in Limetown, Pennsylvania, which I believe now is Cole Bluff, Pennsylvania. Okay. And he is going there to hear Sidney Rigdon preach, and he is enthralled by Sidney Rigdon. He actually writes later on, he says that Sidney Rigdon was the best orator I have ever heard in classing the scriptures together. So we know Sidney Rigdon as still having this oratorical capability that was really powerful, and William Bickerton even attests to that. And after one sermon, he was convinced. And in June 1845, he joined Signe Rigdon's Church of Christ. Okay. So that's how he gets into the Latter-day Saint movement under Signe Rigdon. And so he hears about all the stories about Joseph Smith practicing polygamy of the Twelve. And, and, and uh, William Bickerton really catches on to the Latter-day Saint movement. Very quickly, he is progressing within Rigdon's church. He becomes an elder. Then he becomes a 70. And then eventually he becomes a prophet, priest, and king. Uh, jo uh, Signe Rigdon had started what he called the Grand Council, which was very similar to Joseph Smith's Council of 50. So you see kind of Rigdon reenacting some of these things, because Rigdon was a part of the Council of 50. But instead of having 50 members like Joseph Smith had, uh, Rigdon has 70 members. And what's really interesting, a little side note, so William McClellan, who was an apostle of the original uh, LDS church under Joseph Smith, ends up going with Rigdon and becoming an apostle under Rigdon's church, but he eventually disagrees with Sidney Rigdon, and William McClellan became a, a member of the Grand Council, and he ends up leaving the church. Well, William Bickerton is the one who actually replaces William McClellan in the, oh, really? in the Grand Council. Oh, wow. So a neat, another little neat connection to the Latter-day Saint movement. So William Bickerton really had progressed, become a, had become a major member of the Rigdonite movement, but didn't know Joseph Smith. So why he ends up leaving Sidney Rigdon's church is pretty quickly. So in June of 1845, uh, William Bickerton joins. But then in August of 1845, Sidney Rigdon is kind of wanting to create another communal society because he wants to reenact like the United Order. He was always into communal living. He was even into that when he was a Campbellite minister in Ohio at the, you know, when he met Joseph Smith. So he wanted to kind of reenact that and he believes he's having revelations that they should build the New Jerusalem in the Cumberland Valley of Pennsylvania. So eventually they are having these revelations, he's presenting them to the church, and Sidney Rigdon had organized another school of the prophets, just like Joseph Smith had, and William Bickerton is a member of that school, and they are uh, having, they're praying, and they, you know, they read liberal arts, things like history, English, and this would have been really, um, really would have been interesting to Bickerton because he was not well educated, he was a coal miner, so being able to be schooled and be able to talk with men, that were learning as well would have probably been very uh, uh, interesting to him. And they're also learning you know, the gifts of the Spirit, how to be good ministers for the gospel. So William Bickerton says that as a member of the school, they're having revelations as members of the School of Prophets that Sidney Rigdon is going astray. And so now oh, you kind really? of, yeah, so there's actually kind of like this schismatic movement that's happening within the School of the Prophets that are going against Sidney Rigdon. And Sidney Rigdon and actually calls out these members. He calls out the Mormons in the West, and he calls the members of the people in his own group, basically saying these people are trying to stop us building Zion. And I'm paraphrasing, but he goes, these people are trying to stop us from uh, you know, creating Zion, so we need to keep going forward. And William Bickerton is at this meeting. He's one of those people, and he's hearing his leader talk about this. And it actually says in the newspaper that William Bickerton said that he felt convinced that 
uh, that he felt by the Holy Spirit that he was called to do this work, which is really kind of interesting because according to William Bickerton's account, at this time, he's having these revelations. And then you kind of hear his recording of saying, well, this is what he's saying. He feels compelled by the Holy Spirit. So you kind of see almost like a, a silent, I kind of take it as a silent um, a silent defiance of Sidney Rigdon because he's still kind of having a wait and see approach to see what happens. But he's also feeling, you know, because he's saying by the Holy Spirit, he knows and some of the other elders believe. Mm, I don't know if this is a good idea. So what ends up happening is after that last conference in, uh, in, of the Church of Christ in Pittsburgh, they go into the Cumberland Valley of a couple hundred people that move there. And William Bickerton is not one of those people that goes there. So what year is this approximately? This is in 1846. 1846. So just a year later. Okay. So, and so, so even though William Bickerton, he doesn't leave. At the last minute, he just says, no, I'm not going. And sure enough, Sidney Rigdon's uh, Cumberland Valley experiment to build the New Jerusalem goes bankrupt within a year. Oh, they, wow. The only thing that they could build a temple, they wanted to build this grand temple, and it was literally just a, a barn that they created. And uh, William Bickerton stays back in Pittsburgh and watches everything go collapse. And then there was a few stragglers. I mean, it was really quite dramatic. As they're about to go bankrupt in the Cumberland Valley, they kind of have like this one last fateful attempt. So this is where the millennialism gets in, and it's really interesting. Because Sidney Rigdon really believed Jesus Christ was coming back. That's why he's organizing the Grand Council. He wants to ordain prophets, priests, and kings to kind of prepare for the approaching millennium. He believes that God is going to destroy Nauvoo, and he's going to destroy the, you know, the, the, uh, the 12 and all their followers. And then war, he says, is going to sweep across the land. And Sidney Rigdon has this obsession with Queen Victoria. He thinks he's going to fight Queen Victoria's armies in Britain. I have, you know, he, has, he has this very American Republican attitude. The people didn't like Britain, and you can kind of even see his prejudice towards the British at that time, which is kind of funny. But anyways, um, they have this last fateful attempt knowing that the Cumberland Valley experiment is going to falter because they're, they're defaulting on their, on their loans. So they literally put ascension robes on and they go behind the, the, the barn and all night they fervently pray for Jesus to come back to save them. And oh, to wow. their dismay, he never comes. So, you know, this is in February, I believe, at this time. So it's cold, you know, it's Pennsylvania. And they, all night they're praying. And so they're probably shivering and they just wallow in despair. And sure enough, it eventually collapses. So people lost thousands of dollars. A lot of people literally gave everything for this movement. That was part of Sidney Rigdon's revelations, that you have to give everything for, the, for this communal society. And a lot of people did. So they go bankrupt. And a lot of people personally go bankrupt. So a lot of, there was a few uh, stragglers that come back to Pittsburgh, and according to William Bickerton, a few of them actually coalesced around him and saw him as a leader. So he said that a few of the people that had gone bankrupt, he's now caring for emotionally, spiritually. And William Bickerton's a poor English you know, coal miner. He, he's not even an American citizen. So he's not only got to take care of his growing family on a coal miner's wage. And at this point, he's a coal foreman, so he's making a little bit more money, but not much. And he's also got to care for these people who have gone bankrupt. So that's how he joins the Latter-day Saint wow. movement and kind of has a quick leaving. Uh, well, he never leaves it. That's what's so interesting. You would think after Sidney Rigdon and all this collapse, because William Bickerton originally was a Methodist before he joined Sidney Rigdon. So Methodism around the 1820s is starting to leave the idea of charismatic gifts of like, Methodists used to believe that you could have dreams or visions. They were okay with that. But they're becoming more of a, an established organization, respectable within the community, right? Now, did they do a lot of speaking in tongues as no, well? No, no, no real speaking in tongues necessarily, but they still believed in dreams and visions. And that's kind of going away. And that's what William Bickerton says what was really interesting about Sidney Rigdon, because Sidney Rigdon promised tongues, visions, dreams. And he even said that as a member of uh, the School of the Prophets, they were practicing these spiritual gifts. So you kind of see an earlier form of the Restoration, Sidney Rigdon is really promoting. And William Bickerton liked that because he said, this is a gospel I was never really taught. And he liked that. Well, that's, that also kind of backfired because you can kind of see how revelation can also lead to dissent because they're having revelations as Sidney Rigdon's going wrong. So these <laughs> revelations, I wanted to just pick up on that because I know Sidney was really big on consecration and, and communal living. Mm -hmm. And is that what William didn't like? Is that, is that what he objected to? Yeah, pretty much. Or at least they thought the way he was doing it wasn't, was wrong. Because William Bickerton later on is going to believe in some type of communal living and he's going to try to institute it in the 1870s. 
studies, but not to the um, not to not in the same way that Sidney Rigdon did. So Sidney Rigdon failed just about as badly as Joseph Smith. Is that fair to say? Oh yeah, for sure, for <laughs> sure, absolutely. They, Sidney Rigdon was there with Joseph Smith from the get-go, you know, experiencing financial troubles, and sure enough, as he's trying to lead his own church, basically trying to restore the restoration, he's you know trying to bring it back to the Kirtland era, and, and, and ends up just like Kirtland, just like in Kirtland again. So it's another repeat. And, and when they go bankrupt, minus so, the bank, I guess. Yeah, minus the bank. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So what ends up, the, the, according to the, uh, the account, one of the accounts, it says that when Sidney Rigdon everything goes awry, he abandons his congregation, oh, and he basically tells them, says, if anyone asks to know where I'm gone, tell them I've gone to hell on a thousand years mission. <laughs> and he leaves, and he goes to the Friendship New York to stay with his daughter and his son-in-law. And his son-in-law basically made Sidney Rigdon and told him okay, if you're going to live with us, you cannot talk about religion anymore. Like, that's the deal. And Sidney Rigdon kind of conceded, at least on the face, said, okay, sure. But secretly, he was, you know, still prophesying and writing letters. And Sidney Rigdon eventually is going to start another church called the Church of, Christ, church of Jesus Christ of the Children of Zion with Stephen Post. And Stephen Post was a, a follower of James Strang that eventually gets converted to Sidney Rigdon. And even though they, they're not really meeting in person, Sidney Rigdon is writing a lot of letters to Stephen Post, and Stephen Post is basically doing his bidding to kind of start that church. But that's later on, and William Pickerton has no part of that. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Daniel Stone. In our next conversation, we'll talk about a vision or revelation that William Bickerton had to help him lead the church. And he says that he was, he was carried away in the spirit and placed on a, the highest mountain on the earth, he said. And in one of the accounts, it says that there was just room enough for him to stand on this mountain. And he's basically told, you know, and shown, here you are on this mountain. You're doing everything right. I, you kind of get the sense of, like, he feels like God's telling him, you're on the right track. Stay where you are. Keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. But if you leave this, 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 this path that I've put you on, you're going to fall and tumble. And William Bickerton sees this chasm below. And he says that the Lord told him if he didn't keep doing what he was doing, that he would fall into the chasm. I hope you enjoyed that short clip from our next interview. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please go to our patreon.com slash gospel tangents and subscribe for just $5 a month. If you'd like a transcript of this, please click the yellow subscribe button at gospeltangents.com and I'll send you this and all future transcripts. Also, if you'd like a paperback like we've got here, those are available at our website at amazon.com. Just do a search for Gospel Tangents. Please get all updates at our Facebook page at facebook.com slash gospeltangents. We're also on Twitter at Gospel Tangents. You can also get transcripts individually at our website, gospeltangents.com shop. Finally, make sure that you subscribe on our Apple podcast page. Just do a quick search for uh, Gospel Tangents there and give us a five-star review while you're at it. Thanks again for listening. Your support helps create more Mormon history classes and podcasts such as this. And so I really appreciate you listening. Please share with your friends. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some more of our great videos. Thanks again.